Next up, we have Chris King, uh, developer slash designer of 20XX and 30XX, uh, co-op friendly roguelike Mega Man-ish action platformer games. Uh, excellent. So, hey, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, shall I take it away? Yes, go for it. Right on. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris King. Uh, I've spent the last, oh gosh, nine, 10 years or no so now making uh, co-op roguelike action platformers uh, 20XX and 30XX. Uh, and for so much of those games development cycles, uh, our relationship with our community uh, and their input uh, into our design iteration processes have been such a critical component of us making these games. Uh, that I thought I'd take a little time here uh, to share about letting, you know, letting your players take the wheel uh, without crashing the car. Uh, one of the advantages we have as roguelike developers uh, is that we have this kind of natural audience that wants to play and replay our games, which means when we develop them in an open fashion, uh, we're often able to uh, have the same player base, the same users uh, respond to us and get back to us with our feedback as we change things, which means we kind of have the same audience that can participate in this kind of feedback ideation uh, involvement process uh, every time we change stuff. So now I'm going to click and make sure the slide thing works. Yeah, so this is a very quick talk about open development, design iteration, and community. Uh, this burbling mass of players here uh, is the mass of players that's giving you feedback about your game every time you make a change. Uh, the actual size of your burbling mass of players may vary a little bit, that's fine. Most of the principles here are exactly the same, uh, but if you're able to harness this player feedback uh, correctly and sustainably for yourself, uh, I believe that leads to us making better games for ourselves, uh, and it certainly worked for me. Uh, so two big reasons we care about player feedback today. Uh, the first uh, is that player feedback is a really time efficient source of recognition and ideation. So think of your game feature pipeline as having four big components, uh, recognition, being, hey, uh, I realize that I've got this system that I'd like to change up somehow. Uh, ideation being the creative process by which you come up with iteration proposals or change proposals. Uh, decision, where you actually figure out what subset of those ideations to go ahead and implement to your game, the fourth step implementation. Uh, so for me in particular, uh, I find that deciding from a wide pool of player ideated feedback uh, helps me get to the point where I'm actually able to implement meaningful changes to my game much faster than trying to come up with literally everything uh, myself. So I'm a really strong uh, proponent of open game development where you kind of make the game live in front of a studio audience. Uh, we tend to be on Steam Early Access for way longer periods of time than we originally think we're going to be. Uh, and the other piece here uh, is for perspective's sake. Uh, so player feedback is going to give you perspective on your work uh, that you just can't really develop for yourself. Uh, you make a game for two years and you're never going to have any idea what your own new player experience is like. Uh, you're not going to know unless people tell you. And hopefully, you know, you went to go make the game that you decided to make uh, because you knew something great that you wanted the player to experience. You had kind of a great core concept. Uh, but along the way, you've probably made a whole bunch of changes, a whole bunch of decisions uh, that kind of are flavor aesthetic clashes with some demographic of your would-be player base. People find stuff about your game that bugs them and they think it sucks. Uh, but you don't really have that same sensibility the same way, and so you won't know. And, you know, part of retaining a player base is not turning them off. Uh, so this very, very short talk here is about building your feedback fire hose and then drinking from it sustainably. Uh, and as a, as a small note here, uh, everything I'm talking about is just kind of to give folks hearing an initial nudge, like, I hope that you you come away from this just if you're not already thinking about or integrating player feedback into your design process, that you at least consider this. Uh, if you hear the, you know, couple of quick bullet points, uh, ways to build that feedback and ways to deal with that feedback sustainably. And all you think is, wow, that guy is foolish and doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, that's wonderful because you have a frame of reference for this kind of thing already. You already know what works for you, or maybe you hear what I have to say and you think, wow, for me, it's the exact opposite. That's also wonderful. All that's great stuff. And I'm just hoping you think about it a little bit. Uh, so first, uh, two big points on getting players to give you more feedback. Uh, it's very difficult to give players the <clears throat> to have them increase feedback quality, that can be very challenging, uh, but you can certainly have them give you more feedback, which will eventually give you more good ideas if you can process them all. Uh, so the first one here uh, is to minimize friction like Ned's ski suit here. Uh, you wanna make it as easy as possible for players to give you that feedback. So it means removing all of the possible barriers between the player experiencing something they want to give you feedback on and being able to give you the feedback. Uh, so for us, uh, the stuff that we've done there is we, you know, we have a couple of public forums that we use a lot. We're very active in our Discord. We use our Steam community pretty frequently. 
Uh, we have buttons and links from both of our games, sort of title screens that link to our Discord communities, to our Steam forums. So if you have thoughts, you can post them right away. Uh, one thing I've really wanted to do, uh, but have never had the time because our custom engine makes this a giant pain in the butt, uh, is I've seen a couple of games. Uh, most recently, I think when I played through Rogue Legacy 2, uh, they had a button for most of early access. I doubt it is still there now that they're in 1.0, where you could just press F10 and it would pop up with Reportotron or whatever they called it. And it would automatically populate a form with some basic diagnostic info about where you were in the game when you experienced something that also gives the developers a lot of context. So if that kind of thing is feasible for you, it's great. Uh, the point is, remove as many barriers as you can think of uh, from your players being able to have a feedback-worthy experience and actually giving you the piece of feedback. Uh, as a small note here, maybe don't have your players DM you or email you. It's a little time-consuming for you. We'll talk about that a bit more in a bit. Uh, the other part here is, is now that you've made it easy for players to give you feedback, now encourage them to give you feedback by making it obvious that you care and obvious that you're really listening. Uh, players are more likely to share their feedback with you if they think you're, you're actually paying attention, right? You know, would you call and tell somebody, you know, if you didn't think somebody was listening, would you bother to call and say, hey, I think this should really be a little bit different here. I think this could really elevate the experience. Uh, so listen and be visible doing so. So post in your public spaces, chat in your Discord, uh, be really verbose about your patch notes so that when you change stuff, uh, your players get to see the stuff that you changed. So if you have community suggested changes that make it to the patch notes, anybody reading those notes say or can realize, hey, this developer is taking all of this seriously. Uh, this also gives you uh, an opportunity to set the tone for your community uh, a little bit here. Uh, if you are civil and professional, but you know not too uptight uh, about the way you interact in your public spaces, uh, your players, at least some of your community will kind of follow your lead there. Uh, so it gives them uh, an opportunity to kind of uh, so be civil and sort of set a professional tone with how they deal with stuff. Uh, so those are two very, very high level ways to encourage players to give you feedback, remove the barriers for them giving you feedback and encourage them to do so by uh, sort of pushing the belief, the, the true belief, but get them to see that you really are listening and you really do care. Uh, so now a couple of very high level ways to talk about uh, interacting with that increased volume of feedback without drowning in it. Uh, because of course the worst thing that happens is you encourage all this feedback and then you don't really develop a sustainable process for dealing with it. You burn out, you shy away from your community because you say, oh my God, I haven't looked at my Discord in two weeks and now it's gonna take me two hours to look through everything everybody said in the last while. And that's obviously really tough. Uh, so the first thing here is just to interact efficiently, uh, encourage good force multipliers for you, good uses of your time. Uh, where you can get your players to give you feedback in public spaces. So Discord is great, even though it's a little bit ephemeral. Uh, Steam community is great. Any other kind of persistent forum is wonderful because it lets you know everybody see your answers to users' questions. You know when you discuss something about your work in a public space, a uh, more than just the the questioner gets the answer uh, if they choose to read it, and b uh, your your veteran folks in your community uh, are going to look at the answers you gave they're going to internalize those answers. And then in the future, they're going to give people those answers uh, for you. So you don't have to do it. Uh, in terms of your own scheduling and timing, uh, anytime you have induced or incidental high tide, so patches, uh, if your game takes off, releases, milestones, anytime you know that the community is going to be especially active, uh, or if you've given them a reason to be especially active, you know, participate actively, be around, make time for this. Uh, it's not free. It's definitely expensive, but it's cheaper than coming up with all the ideas and the feedback yourself. Uh, and during less busy times when you don't have this kind of high tide going on, uh, batch your feedback sessions. Uh, you may organically be able to uh, just sort of figure this out for yourself. You know, oh, you know, I'm checking out for the day. Why don't I check with the community real quick? Or, you know, oh, I'm on a break. Why don't I, you know, answer a few questions? Uh, you may hit points in your life where this doesn't come organically to you. Uh, and if you realize this is happening, schedule time for it. Uh, because as I mentioned a bit ago, it can be really overwhelming to feel like, oh gosh, I haven't responded to my fans in weeks now. And now there's this big expectation. So going out of your way to schedule it, if you realize you're not doing it organically, is, is really important. Uh, and remember that, uh, obviously, uh, player feedback is incredible when it comes to general you know, testing, stability, that kind of uh, you know, bug and QA related stuff. There's obviously a lot of lesson there. But here today, specifically, we're talking about the ideation and recognition steps of feature design and development. Uh, and so all of this still comes down to your taste. So the important part here, what I'm trying to get at is make sure that as you, as you, uh, as you comprehend and go through the wave of player feedback you receive, that you're still kind of filtering it all of it through your own taste and your own experience. You know, you're asking, 
do these suggestions fit? Do they clash with other things I'm working on? Are they in work scope? Like you might have a lot of great ideas given to you that, you know, well, that's the basis of a whole nother game and I could spend two years doing that. Uh, obviously, if a player is expressing a pain point or a crash or a, you know, this bug really impacts my fun of the game, these are important things to keep note of. But remember, uh, you are not uh, making a, you're not instilling a democracy by doing this. Uh, you and your team are still the, the sort of final arbiters of what goes into your work and what doesn't. So don't let hearing all of the community feedback become I'm just going to implement whatever is popular with the community. That's not the way to go. At least it's it's not the way to go for us. Uh, I'm sure there is somebody out there that maybe works for, uh, but we you know make sure that everything we're hearing from the community, you know, we're actively listening. We're talking about things that we agree with, that we disagree with. We often, you know, if there's popular stuff that we're not going to do, you know, we'll kind of go out of our way to say, hey, uh, we hear that you guys are asking for this. Uh, we don't feel that this is the right fit for the game, and here's why. So that the community still knows we're listening and we're not just ignoring, uh, you know, popular public stuff. Uh, and on the other side of that coin, uh, lots of wonderful suggestions come from one-off uh, suggestors. The number of times that we've gotten wonderful pieces of feedback for 20 and 30 XX that came from one user that I'd never heard of before and never heard from again uh, were really, really high and really valuable for the game. Uh, so that's a kind of everything I wanted to go through today. I know it's a lightning talk. I know that all of this is super high level, kind of surface level stuff. Uh, but uh, if you want to sort of dig into this kind of thing a little bit more, uh, obviously from a different perspective, because it was three years ago, uh, I gave a longer talk about 20XX's whole early access community development and sort of interaction uh, cycle uh, GDC a couple of years back. Uh, I wrote a really long postmortem about our first game, 20XX, uh, sometime after we finished it on Gamasutra, now game developer. Uh, and I'm always really happy to talk about this kind of thing uh, with you know anybody who wants to chat about it too. You know, again, as roguelike designers, we have this kind of wonderful built-in you know, community. As we build communities, we end up being able to retain individual players uh, really well compared to sort of the, the average game, whatever that means. Uh, and by really harnessing that and letting players be part of our kind of design recognition and ideation process, uh, we can help ourselves out and we can make better games out of it. Uh, so I think that's, that's everything I've got. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope any of this was at least a little bit informative or giving you a little bit of frame of reference for something. Uh, thank you so much to the Roguelike Celebration organizers and staff uh, for putting on this wonderful event. Uh, it's really cool. It's fantastic seeing everybody's uh, everybody's talks. Uh, and I'm looking forward to checking it out for the rest of the weekend. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's very nice. I appreciate uh, you guys don't have to use your limited time to thank us, but it's very kind of you. <laughs> of course. Uh, yes, which like we have time for one question if anyone wants to toss one in. Um, good job having a quick enough lightning talk to actually have time for questions. Yeah, I planned for 10 minutes knowing I'd run over to 12. So when I saw the 15 minute slot, I went, yes. Yeah, that's very smart. Um, I guess one thing, seeing that like, I think no one has had like an off the cuff question. That's my job now. No problem. Uh, I, I think you, you touched a little bit on it, but like maintaining also the almost uh, mental health boundary in terms of like when to be on and offline in terms of managing your, you know, how much you're drinking from the fire hose. Do you have any other kind of quick tips for handling that aspect of kind of taking in a lot of user feedback? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Uh, the, the biggest thing, the most important thing comes right up front and it's planning, it's planning for it. Uh, there's a slide that I, that I cut here with sort of a chart of my personal community management spend time on 20XX, where I really spent about eight hours a week or so interacting with the community, you know, something out of my total work time, you know, it was like, I don't know, 15, 16% of my total spend. Uh, and if I hadn't made that time up front, if you don't plan for it, you don't have time for it. You don't have time to do the job well. Um, and just being able to, you know, it is obviously it's a very different form of work than design, than programming, than whatever else you're doing that actually makes the game the game. But it is work just like anything else. Uh, and if you don't treat it that way, it's going to kick your butt. Yeah, for sure. I think I'm guilty. I mean, it's hard, I think, for a lot of us to, to know when to log off of anything, yeah. but especially yeah, when only... to log off of your own game feedback. Exactly. The only reason I know that is because I didn't do it the first time, and I was like, oh, okay, I, I got to do this. This is important. Yeah. Um, excellent. Actually, so one super quick question, maybe. Um, yeah. After a long early access, how do you compartmentalize that your committed players are no longer valid first-time users either? Oh my gosh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, you. You can't really. Uh, the feedback you get, uh, one of the things that you do as you, you know, you interact with the community for several hours a week, you get to know people and you, you know, you can kind of understand their perspectives when they provide feedback. And you sort of, you begin to understand a little bit about the individual 
which also lets you sort of categorize their feedback. Uh, this is kind of an offshoot of the actual question, but uh, you know, I have at least one user in the community that I know, you know, is very pleasant and civil, but kind of doomsays everything. And so when a user, you know, if it's this average level of doomsaying about a feature or something, you know, I kind of intuitively understand, oh, this is just average. This is his regular reaction to a thing. Uh, but as that happens, you know, you completely lose the ability to understand when somebody is new. Uh, and so especially when it comes to getting like new player feedback, a lot of that bleeds over into alternative sources of guaranteeing that players are new, like showing at conventions uh, and, uh, you know, specifically getting feedback related to demos if your game's pre-release and you have kind of like an early, early community before your game actually yeah. comes out. Uh, that's very hard though. It's a, it's a tough question to answer in just a minute. Yeah, yeah, so great question. Uh, and, and yeah, way to answer <laughs> quick lightning round questions like a champ.